We must not embellish or dress up Christianity. It has waged a deadly war against this higher type of man. It has banned all fundamental instincts of this type. It has distilled evil, the evil one, out of these instincts. Strong man as the typical reprobate, as outcast man. Christianity has taken the part of everything weak, low, ill-constituted. It has made an ideal out of the antagonism to the preservative instincts of strong life. It has ruined the reason even of the intellectually strongest natures in that it taught men to regard the highest values of intellectuality as sinful, as misleading, as temptations. The most lamentable example, the ruin of Pascal, who believed in the ruin of his intellect by original sin, while it had only been ruined by his Christianity. It is a painful and thrilling spectacle that has presented itself to me. I have drawn back the curtain on the depravity of man. This word in my mouth is, at all events, guarded against one suspicion, that it involves a moral accusation of man. It is, I should like to underline it once more, meant in the sense of freedom from any moralic acid, and this to the extent that that depravity is felt by me most strongly just there, where one hitherto most consciously aspired to virtue and divinity. I understand depravity. One makes it out already, in the sense of decadence. My assertion is that all values in which mankind now compromise their highest desirability are decadence values. I call an animal, a species, an individual, depraved when it loses its instincts, when it selects, when it prefers what is harmful to it. A history of higher sentiments, of ideals of mankind, and it is possible that I shall have to tell it again, would almost also be the explanation for why man is so depraved. Life itself I regard as instinct for growth, for continuance, for accumulation of forces, for power. Where the will to power is lacking, there is decline. My assertion is that this will is lacking in all the highest values of mankind, that values of decline, nihilistic values, hold sway under the holiest Seven. names. Christianity is called the religion of sympathy. Sympathy stands in antithesis to the tonic passions which elevate the energy of the feeling of life. It operates depressively. One loses force by sympathizing. The loss of force which suffering has already brought upon life is still further increased and multiplied by sympathy. Suffering itself becomes contagious through sympathy. Under certain circumstances, a total loss of life and vital energy may be brought about by sympathy, such as stands in an absurd proportion to the extent of the cause, the case of the death of the Nazarene. That is the first point of view. There is, however, one still more important. Supposing one measures sympathy according to the value of the reaction which, as a rule, it brings about, its mortally dangerous character appears in a much clearer light still. Sympathy thwarts, on the whole, in general, the law of development, which is the law of selection. It preserves what is ripe for extinction. It resists in favor of life's disinherited and condemned ones. It gives to life itself a gloomy and questionable aspect by the abundance of the ill-constituted of all kinds whom it maintains in life. One has dared to call sympathy a virtue. In every superior morality it is regarded as a weakness. One has gone further. One has made it the virtue the basis and source of all virtues. Only, to be sure, which one must always keep in mind, from the point of view of a philosophy which was nihilistic, which inscribed the denial of life on its escutcheon. Schopenhauer was right in maintaining that life was denied by sympathy, was made worthier of denial. Sympathy is the practice of nihilism. To repeat, this depressive and contagious instinct thwarts those instincts which strive for the maintenance and elevation of the value of life. 
It is, both as the multiplier of misery and as the conservator of all misery, a principal tool for the advancement of decadence. Sympathy persuades to nothingness. One does not say nothingness, one says instead the other world, or God, or true life, or nirvana, salvation, blessedness. This innocent rhetoric, out of the domain of religio-moral idiosyncrasy, at once appears much less innocent when one understands what tendency here wraps the mantle of sublime expressions around itself, the tendency hostile to life. Schopenhauer was hostile to life, therefore sympathy became a virtue to him. Aristotle, as is known, saw in sympathy a sickly and dangerous condition, which one did well, now and then, to get at by a purgative. He understood tragedy as a purgative. From the instinct of life, one should, in fact, seek an expedient to put a puncture in such a morbid and dangerous accumulation of sympathy as the case of Schopenhauer shows, and, alas, also, our entire literary and artistic decadence from St. Petersburg to Paris, from Tolstoy to Wagner, so that that bubble might burst. Nothing in our unhealthy modernism is more unhealthy than Christian sympathy. To be a physician here, to be pitiless here, to apply the knife here, that belongs to us, that is our mode of charity. With that we are philosophers, we Hyperboreans. Eight.